administrative skill set, but I didn't know a ton about industry things. So I use it as an opportunity to start learning and educating myself, actively educating myself. So that's how the job mm-hmm. started, right? Editorial content, yeah. content sessions, radio drops, and podcasts. And then we built the multi-million dollar studio. So, <laughs> so Atlantic moved from its original location that I started at, and they moved to a different building. And when they move, they use it as an opportunity to really build out some of the facilities and to think about what the artists may need. So this move came with a brand new photo studio. It came with a brand new recording studio, a brand new art department. And obviously who was up to bat? Your girl, you know? So (laughs) they didn't have a studio manager. They didn't have a head engineer. They didn't have any of that. It was just, it was just go time, you know? And the, and the artist obviously wanted to start recording albums and making records in this gorgeous new studio that we had. So a lot of great projects instantly came through the door. And one of the first projects was Hamilton. So that's what kicked off everything and resulted in my getting my first professional engineering credit. And obviously all the rest of the credits started rolling from there. And I've been learning and studying and growing as a producer over the course of all this time, now getting the opportunity to work, work across genres and to do so much artistically and creatively for the company. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, you you mentioned to me also that you do you do these things called like a, a demo uh, signing. Do you mind talking about that? Yeah, I'll talk about it loosely. So now, obviously, the studio program has grown. I'm not the only engineer anymore. We have other engineers. So that gives me opportunity to branch out and spread my wings a little bit more and flex some of my additional muscles with respect to the other things that I've learned. So A&R is one of the things that I'm learning and branching into now. And I started a program at Atlantic called the Studio Incubator, which allows me to sign artists and produce them. So essentially they're signing on to a demo deal or development deal that allows me to develop them, produce all of their music and present them to the, to the label for a potential option of what we've made together or a potential signing of them to the formal roster. So that's something that I'm really excited about. We're almost at this point a year into the program. So it's fairly new and I've learned a tremendous amount about A&R, about doing deals and fortunately, I've had a lot of quality mentorship from my colleagues at Atlantic who've been really helping me build this program out. So um, my next signing is gearing up pretty soon. I'm very excited about it. Um, some of the some of the health issues, the, the COVID-19 that we're experiencing now is um, somewhat sure. posing an issue with respect to working remotely. But I'm still very excited about the things sure. I'm working on and the artists that I'm working with. So that's awesome. So you mentioned that you got to reco- be involved in the recording of the Hamilton uh, uh, cast production, I guess, original cast uh, recording for the Broadway play. That's yeah. that's super cool. Like, would you mind sharing a little bit about what was involved in doing that kind of recording and what that experience was like working with all these people, like Lin Manuel Miranda? Yeah, and all it, it was. Guys? A, it was. The experience of working on Hamilton was pretty incredible because never had I up until that point worked on musical theater and I'd never seen artists of that caliber who have such a high expectation for the music that they're doing and have such an intention with respect to what they decide to make and what they want to create. And so Lynn obviously has such phenomenal vision and he's always able to think about what he wants to do with his art in culture and society and how he wants it to affect people for change and for the better. And so that imperative trickled down throughout the whole production process. So I had an Mm -hmm. opportunity to serve as an assistant engineer on that album. It's my very first engineering credit. And I got to assist the lead engineering staff, which included Derek Lee and... Tim Latham and 
Alex Lacamoire, they pretty much handled the vast majority of the engineering task and the composition task, the post-production work, which included a tremendous amount of comping. I mean, you're talking about over 40 songs, close to 50 songs. It was an extreme amount of comping, a lot of mixing to do. They had two rooms going at once, and it was my job to supervise. I had to basically go in and do editing if there was a need for that. I also had to prep all the computers a month in advance before they got there, ensuring that all the technology that they needed and requested was there and that it was all working accordingly. So I ended up building the rig that was used in the comping suite, putting that whole thing together, making sure it was working properly, making sure all the plugins and all the software was working up to date, current. Uh, I was also networked to the computers, making sure you could drop files between the different rooms And obviously, when they get there, assisting, listening, jumping in when it's time to do editing work, jumping in if it's time to assist with any mixing. And actually also had to jump in and do some recording because there was still some recording happening. So me, obviously, I knew all the mics, I knew the room. So I had to be a person really making critical choices when we did do recordings about what type of technology we were using and why. Wild. Do you mind uh, sharing how they recorded it? I was like, is it kind of recorded like a Broadway play or is it just, you know, one person in front of the mic doing their part, knowing what they're doing? A mix of both. Right. So there's yeah. a recording the orchestra, which is mostly everybody recording together as many pieces as you possibly can. But then there's overdubbing. So overdubbing requires parts that maybe need to be fixed or parts that weren't recorded when they should have been or changes in personnel that require the new artists to come in and sing the parts. So overdubbing was something that I was a part of more so than the orchestra recordings. Mm, cool. That's amazing. What, what, a, what, a, what an experience to be a part of. It was pretty I, great. I, I imagine. <laughs> it, was, no, awesome. it, was, it was great. And it set the bar very high for how I think about my art, the type of people I want around helping to create and build out my team of artists that I keep around me. It's um, also made me think very critically about studio culture and how to manage that and what types of studio cultural environments create quality music and a quality experience for everybody involved. That's really cool. Um, so, so these days, like when you seek out an artist to work with, what do you, what are you looking for exactly? And how do you see if it's going to be a good fit? There are actually quite a few things I'm looking for and I I do have a checklist, but I don't have it in front of me. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of things. So the first thing I'm looking for is integrity, honesty, someone who's in the business for more than just a paycheck or a payday but somebody that's very conscious of the contribution that they want to make and how they plan to use music to touch people. Because that's how I think about my career. So I'm always looking for somebody that's like-minded and that wants to move with a sense of virtue and wants to make music with a sense of virtue. I'm also looking for an artist that is more than mid-tier. I mean, I'm sorry, more than just beginning stages. I mean, as talented as so many artists are that are just starting out, I'm really looking for somebody that's slightly more established and they've built a team around themselves. There's a manager in place. There's you know a handful of people on the team, a lawyer, people who are thinking about what they're doing as building a whole company. They're really thinking in entrepreneurial terms about their career. They're not just a talented artist or a talented singer, but they're they're thinking in business terms because you you really want to have both when it comes to creating artists and bringing them to labels because you're not just mm. putting them on stage, you're bringing them to a company that's a, a business that wants to partner with another business essentially so there needs to be some sort of infrastructure with respect to that i'm also looking for genius if i can't have genius i'm looking for talent right it it can be hard to find a genius artist yeah sure (laughs) there are a lot of them out there i would i would prefer to work with a genius uh but if not a genius somebody that's extremely talented and skilled. I believe there's a difference between talent and skill. Lots of people have talent. 
skill is earned though the the skill means that you've refined your talent such that you put in your hours you know put in your hours and you can do something consistently time and time again so skill equates in my eyes with consistency so I'm looking for artists that's put some time into recording themselves, that's put some time into writing songs, they've put some time into playing their instrument. When they go into the studio, they're bringing the best parts of themselves and they're working very hard and they're professional because they put their time in. So that's something that I'm expecting, you know, and that also equates with punctuality and preparedness. Those are all things that I think fall under the umbrella of being skilled. Um, but it's always yeah. great if you can find a gifted artist, somebody that's truly gifted. I find it hard to believe that when Jerry Wexler laid his eyes on Aretha Franklin, he, he was like, oh, she's talented. You know, <laughs> like you look at right. an Aretha Franklin and you go, that's a gifted human being. You know, she put right. so much time and, and you kind of just, you kind of know it doesn't take you a whole lot of convincing to, to realize that this person is gifted. I'm always on the lookout for that type of artist, somebody that's gifted and with the right support and the resources that can really go on to be a dynamic talent that blesses generations for years to come. So those are three things. I have other things, but those are some of the things that I'm always looking for in artists that I work with. Yeah, it's so funny you say that because that's that kind of like I read Clive Davis's uh, autobiography a few years ago and he talks about when he saw Alicia Keys for the first time, he like had that like feeling like, oh, this woman is going to do that. You know what I mean? Like just like a spark of this person has has that thing. And it's not it's not very common. Uh, so generally speaking, like how do you get started with your productions? Like do you have like a method or is it or is it just depends on the song, the genre? Do you have any any consistent things that you do to get going? Right. It depends on what the goal is. So when producing for an artist, the first thing I do is think about that artist and who they are and what they're bringing to the table. So I have to do a little bit of research into the type of music they make. Right. I'm not going to produce a hip hop song for a country artist like so I have to do some research into that artist and some of their influences. If I'm producing for a singer, I like to get a sense of that that singer's range. What key do they sing in? What key are they comfortable singing in? And that might require a lot of time of listening through whatever they had they've made before and think, thinking about the key that those compositions revolve around. Some people are really comfortable in D minor. Some people are really comfortable in F sharp. Right. So thinking about compositions that embody the persona and the essence of that artist. So if I'm producing specifically for somebody, there's a lot of study that goes into that. If I'm just making stacks of beats. I like to be as free as possible and I like to have as much fun as possible. And I don't like to be entirely weighed down by, in quotes, what I'm supposed to make. But I do spend a lot of time researching popular music, popular producers, and their different sounds. So all of that ends up influencing the type of tracks I make, even when I'm just being free-formed and less formulaic. I'm still thinking about the trends. So yeah. even, even, even if I plan to break all those rules, I'm, I'm thinking about those trends. I'm aware of them. Are you are you monitoring those tracks like kind of in between while you're still working on a song? Are you, are you referencing? Yeah, I made two tracks before I got on a call with you today. So the first track was a mix that I'm doing by an artist for an artist, and he sent me a reference, a popular reference by a new artist named Lil Dirk. So I'm a being a being a being from a mix perspective just to see where does my song fit within this sonic landscape. That is modern hip hop production. There's there's a very specific sound that is modern hip hop production. And so how are my mixes and my tracks even in conversation with that? They don't have to sound the same, but they should be able to at least play back to back. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. If my track comes on behind the latest and hottest track on the radio, do they at least sound like they belong on the same playlist? 
And because you want to yeah. be in a conversation, like what conversation is my track having with the previous track? And they can be co- completely different songs. Like you can listen to the Billboard top 